Oh ho ho! Hello, hello. Um, I'm super happy to be here with Etienne today. Well, yes. We're going to present you our crazy project. Uh, for those of you that know Etienne, he gave a lot of talk in the past. He's a super ninja belt, uh, Kotlin, Android developers. I'm fairly new who, uh, to you guys. It's the first time here. I gave talk in Montreal, but uh, first time in Paris. Super happy to see you. I'm uh, working for Bell Canada. Uh, it's a orange of uh, a telco operator in Canada, a big one. And I'm a charge if uh, I'm a service lead in the innovation lab. Uh, and what is an innovation lab in a telco company? Good question, because <laughs> we're uh, used to buy stuff and not really innovate, but uh, things change. Uh, we are basically trying to find use of 5G and innovative use cases. And what we're going to present today uh, is pretty much aligned with this research for a purpose for 5G. <laughs> we're also going to speak about Mac. I don't know if you guys know about Mac. Mac is a mobile multi-edge access uh, computing. Uh, basically, it's a bringing the cloud into the Delco infrastructure so we can get lower latency. We'll speak of that later on. So our lab is trying to do uh, little POCs, lean startup style, where we create values and see if it's, it's going to stick to the wall. And if it does, we create a service, an, an innovative service out of this. Uh, sky's the limit in terms of ideas. Budget is not <laughs> unlimited. But uh, just... Uh, we're still looking for ideas, partnerships, and what's not. So wink, wink. If you have good ideas that require high speed, low latency, please see me. We're open for business on any use cases. So today we're going to speak about this crazy project uh, that got strongly inspired by Mario Kart uh, Live. I don't know if you guys ever saw this. It's uh, basically a mix of a game, Mario Kart, and a real physical cars that is RC control. Basically, this uh, allows pl players to run the cars through the room, and the users see the point of view of the camera on the, their RC cars. So the question we ask ourselves is, can we do that coast to coast, and a remote player in Vancouver could drive a car in Montreal? This was kind of the initial idea. So what we did is we went to the marketing team of Bell that, we, uh, that sponsored the Formula One Grand Prix in Montreal. And we kind of int the idea that, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have like a miniature race cars driven by 5G, players with their phone could drive the cars, and hence the idea was launched. And they got, yeah, sure, but we have a few conditions. First, it should be activated uh, online for May to June, and then at the event, people should try it and be uh, able to uh, fiddle with it. And this might be... Uh, fairly easy if we, if we do it online, but you'll see there's a bit of challenge on that. And another challenge is that we were not ab able to do a native app. And I know this is Android conference, native app is pretty much a bread and butter, uh, but we have a web experience that works, uh, and the car itself, itself is a native application. So we still have a native app, and we'll see that later on. And it was also an excuse to showcase our private 5G capabilities and the Mac stack. Um, right now, the project is not finished. Uh, we would have hoped that everything was nailed and everything, but right now we're building the racetrack, we're building the cars, the final look and feel of the cars. So as you can see, we're just right, the, right here. It's, uh, we have functional prototypes, but uh, I, I still don't have much sleep thinking about this project, but the thing's going well. <laughs> All right. So uh, just to add extra spice on the technical stack that we just mentioned, the Formula One site, is a very small island, and there's only over 100k users, and that will disrupt the whole telco system. It saturates the bandwidth, uh, the uh, airwaves, and it's going to be a very harsh, hostile environment. Even the Wi-Fi is disrupted, uh, and this is based on the nature of the <laughs> number of users. So we cannot rely on the current networks. And to add to the, uh, the, the challenge, we are not owner of the spectrum, uh, the public spectrum on the island, and the, uh, the deployments of those antenna is not under our control. So what we had to do is to find a fre frequency that we own, and we're going to deploy a private 5G on that specific frequency. It's not the best frequency, it's N38, which is kind of limited, but I'll explain that later on. Uh, it needs also to be a fun experience, and to get a fun experience, you need to have low latency play. 
So over 150 milliseconds, you still you feel the lag, and it's going to be hard to drive those cars. So that's a very harsh target, especially when the phone itself will have almost 100 uh, milliseconds delay to compute the frames and send it to the pipes. And we need also to prevent a destruction derby. So I know out there, creative drivers will try to just destroy every car. <laughs> so we need to prevent that somehow without manual intervention. How are we going to do that? Uh, first, we're going to assemble a team. Um, we made a call for XCN, that is an Android developer, and also we had an external firm called Walrus that make the, all the branding of the cars, the racetrack, all that stuff. I'm not very good at <laughs> making little cars, so we needed external help. These guys are also doing the website that will be used for the customer experience. And uh, we also have Nokia that provided us uh, freely a private 5G core and Google that has the help us on the GDC stack, mech stack. I'm going to speak about that later on. So with this little team, we came up with this solution here, and I'm going to activate my super power pen. Here we go. So as I mentioned, this client app is a website, and it's going to be served by the regular cloud. The user will go there, register itself, uh, queue itself into a racetrack slot. From there, the admin will either kick bad players or uh, coordinate stuff. And basically, once the race is starting, those client apps will be sending and connect directly peer-to-peer -peer through WebRTC on the car. The car itself is composed of Android phones with a USB connection on an ESP32. ESP32 is a PCB, a uh, little board, development board that is fairly cheap and has the ability to connect uh, with the PMW pins and MyO and stuff. Anyway, more details on that later. <laughs> yes. And we are going to use the camera there uh, to end send the video packets to the uh, uh, web client and also use the web client to send telemetry and control to the device itself. All that is supported by the, uh, the edge where we're going to put an AI solution that will oversee operation and intervene if something is going sour. And we also have the private 5G core that will make a private network on site to prevent, uh, by, to actually allow connectivity without disruption on the public network. So that's the overall plan here. And <clears throat> that's, uh, I, I, I guess, Android developers usually don't really work in telco, so I'm going to just briefly explain a bit what's private 5G. It's not just a fancy Wi-Fi system. It's much more complicated. I was thinking it was just a fancy thing that you plug the, the internet and, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go. No, it's a bit more complex. Uh, first, there's a radio. You can cook your eggs on that. It's super <laughs> hot every day. And there's an the antenna that will broadcast the signal. And basically, the core here is the, it's the system that will say, oh, that SIM card has been provisioned. This user is allowed to transmit or uh, get services. And we install a little Raspberry Pi to test our system. And this is the, the benchmark we get here. So we have under 20 milliseconds delay right now. So that's pretty neat. Uh, regular public signal is almost twice that from 30, 40-ish. But uh, so we reduce a lot the, the speed there, but it's not the best speed 5G can provide yet because the stack of low latency is not fully deployed, but more to come. I mentioned TDD and 38, so that means that the, uh, it's time slot that the uh, telco has to transmit and download and download, and we slice that with other operators, and so we share that bandwidth with other operators. That means that we don't have the full spectrum to play around, and it has some limitation. So hence the speed we see here is not that great, but for the limitation of the, uh, the deployment, we're only going to get four phones active for four cars racing on the track itself. So it's not a big deal. One big challenge we had is that N38 is, I think it's a common band used in Europe, but not in Canada. So all the devices that we had, Android and all that, we're not supporting N38 out of the box, even if the Qualcomm chipset was supporting it uh, as per the spec. So you cannot just assume, go in mobile syrup and see the spec and say, oh, N38 is supported by Qualcomm, I'm, oh, I'm going to just use it. So when, you, you, when we have our firmware installed in the, uh, the, the phone, those bands are filtered out by the quality control um, department. <clears throat> so we had to fiddle a bit to find actual phone that will work on that private network, and it was kind of challenging. Um, also, beware that private 5G in Canada, you need to speak with a telco because the whole spectrum of 5G has been sold to telcos. So there's not a public spectrum like in the United States um, that can be used by anyone. 
Wi-Fi is an example of public spectrum. Everyone, you don't require a license to plug your Wi-Fi system, so it's kind of similar there. But for private 5G, uh, you need to speak with a telco. But in a few years, there is going to be a, <coughs> a private, uh, a public uh, band. Uh, also, um, for developers, the UPF is a user plane function. <coughs> See it as a, a tunnel that is uh, from the telco to the internet. This gets shut down if you are not using the connection. So if you're making a game and you see a huge spike of latency, it's probably because your game was idling, and after a few seconds or minutes, depending on the telco, it's going to shut down. So keep that in mind, and it will disrupt your experience if you're not transmitting constantly. Overall, 5G private is a bit better than Wi-Fi because the coordination behind the scenes allow much better transmission and coordination of multiple customers. So hence, we're pretty happy with the, with the setup we have so far. All right, so the MEC, the multi-edge access computing, is um, just the concept that the regular cloud is uh, here. So if your device is going to the telco, it's going to go to the, the core. OK, the user has been established. The UBF will be set, and it's going to get to the, the cloud. There's going to be traffic here. Uh, there's usually shared resources there. And overall, this is a bit longer than if we are the telco owner of the infrastructure directly on our infrastructure. So we avoid all the internet here, and it's faster. So how much faster? Really, it depends on all the case. If you're living in a, st in a city super far uh, from a, the main data center of the cloud provider, it's going to be much faster. If you're in the same city as the data center, you won't see much benefits. So the test we made was about 35% faster with the Mac. <coughs> all right, so for how, can, how are we going to prevent anti-destruction uh, derby? Basically, uh, we put an AI solution that will track the race. Uh, uh, we're going to get two or three cameras, depending on the, on the coverage. And we're going to use YOLO to track the position of the cars. And basically, when we're going to detect position, static position or uh, bound uh, cars, we're going to put a yellow flag, lower the speed of the cars, and all that. So all this will run a very fast, low latency setup in the MEC stack, where we're going to reach, uh, send the frames to the MEC stack. The inference is going to happen and send back position of the cars. We're also investigating the Aruco uh, markers, just to make it easier. This is more open CV, out of the box uh, approach. Uh, but right now, YOLO is really performant, and I think we're going to keep it. In the near future, we wanted to put the AI embedded into the Android device. Uh, so to kind of uh, like a little Tesla embedded uh, self-driving assistant. Uh, but uh, we only have a few months, so let's keep it simple for now. All right, so here's come a couple of screenshots of the track that is being built as we speak today in a Bell studio. So the intent is that uh, we Bell has also have a... TV studio, and we'll uh, broadcast that on Twitch and, and make some kind of noise uh, in the Canadian media. And this is the, uh, the track that we're building right now. It's pretty neat. I'm eager to see it. It is very neat. Um, and this are my, these are the early prototypes. Uh, so it's basically a, a robot kit that you can buy on Amazon for 85 bucks or even 40 bucks. Uh, I think um, yeah, we have smaller, two, two, two smaller ones are 40, and the nicer ones with like all those servos are a bit more expensive. And the final one is a $600 one, and it's so fast that we can actually use it on the real Formula One track in Montreal. And that will happen in two weeks. Uh, so it's going to 70 kilometers per hour. We cannot use this car with the same motor or the same speed on our little tracks. It's going to be uh, way too fast for the users. Uh, so that's the, uh, the prototype. You will see a demo soon. If, uh, and this is the final look and feel. So we can see the Android phones sitting in the car. Uh, we're going to leverage the camera. We're going to leverage the 5G modem, <coughs> the storage, the battery uh, to transmit as a WebRTC. And we just put a plastic shell on top of the, uh, the prototypes that you're going to see soon. Um, there's, the branding is not settled yet, but uh, soon uh, we're going to settle on that. This is some UI mockups of the web experience. Uh, work in progress as well, but basically this is the point of view of the user, uh, the mini track that will uh, leverage the position of the AI that we have, and uh, yeah. So you're going to compete against four other players, uh, so uh, four other cars will be on a track at the same time, and uh, there's a schedule and a queue system, uh, pretty neat stuff overall. I think we're now due for a live demo of our little robots. I'm so sure it's everything will go very well. Make magic, please. Yeah.
So uh, we're gonna sort of open the kimono on this one. We we were planning on making it all like invisible, and but you know what? It might actually be interesting to see our prototype uh, interfaces. So let's jump in. So obviously, it's not something that's going to be ever exposed to the actual players. Uh, these are really our prototypes to measure lag and see if we had a good solution. So uh, we're uh, we have we've touched on it. We use WebRTC under the hood, and so here we're just like effectively starting the uh, media communication. I'm going to check on all the little variables we have here today. So you can imagine that this Wi-Fi is actually oversaturated and cannot possibly help us. So we're going to restart this right away and go on to our own private. No, it's not 5G. It's actually just Wi-Fi. Um, all right, so we're creating a room. You Did I have time to negotiate the license for broadcast? <laughs> no, no, they didn't call us back for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, all right. So no spoilers, but we have to establish a connection. Aha. So we're going to maximize all that. Hopefully, we didn't pass any secrets in this JavaScript dump that I uh, noticed that I didn't hide. <laughs> all right. Let's just tuck this away. OK. Uh, wait. I actually forgot a step and also why this was here. So let's see. Now we're in good shape. All right. Is this working? Le moment de vérité. Murphy loves incoming. Yes. <laughs> well, the good thing is I've looked at the timer, and we're not yet over time. Oh, I see. This is interesting. All right. Well, sure come here. Come here. The, it's going to be more interesting, actually. Yeah, most likely. I just, we just Don't hide in the, in the shadow. Is this working right there? Can we see the crown? It's not. It's not. All right. Did you try reboot the computer? No, <laughs> no we're not going to go to that step. If you've ever seen a talk with me and robots in this room before, you know that this is uh, the classic. Oh, <laughs> this is taking a bit of time. But we're looking in good shape. Keep in mind, this is beta software. I can right. sing in the meantime. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you, you do a pretty mean show tune, if I remember properly, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. There we go. Hello. Say hello, Android makers. Woo! Oh, All nice. right. This is nice. Can we redo it? I'm going to take a shot at this one. All right. Hey. Some oh, wow. I want to just say thank you to all our sponsors who are paying for us to be here today. Wave. Please wave so we can come back eventually. It's okay. It's okay. I got it. All right. Cool. <laughs> oh, okay. you there. You're, you didn't smile. Come on. Ah, we have to start this all over again. All right. So at this point, what I'm doing is I'm trying to hook up this PlayStation joystick to the browser, which has a pretty neat interface. And I will punch this up and hopefully... Ah, I'm seeing some It's action. alive, Jim. Yeah. It's also... Somehow, well, it has its own agenda. It right has now. its own agenda, but overall, it looks like we're going to be able. It's to okay. We have two weeks to about this. fix everything. Wait, what's going before on? Before a public shame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no stress. You might not know this. We've actually stayed up pretty late last night working on a prototype specifically for this Wi-Fi setup, which is working great. What are you doing? Uh, we have videos of this actually working, so... It's never actually done this before. We might rely on that backup. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well... Maybe explain the magic uh, or debugging well, we're gonna it. Start the, we're going to start the rest of the talk here, and uh, hopefully we'll get to... I'm going to kick the machine the end, in the back end. Uh, I think we're going to fix it. Shape. I'll try one last time, and then after that we'll keep going with the talk. And if so, this is... Actually, good stuff. It's stretching. Yeah, stretching. A little practice run. So this is looking good. Before I get to stretch the machine before the demo. No. Yeah. So we had, to, we had to do everything on a local setup at the last minute because we realized that the Wi-Fi here would not help us or that we couldn't actually get a proper 5G connection set up in Europe with our Canadian equipment. So one last try with the joysticks. Hopefully, we'll get something good this time around. Maybe people have questions in the meantime. I don't know. Let's entertain them. Any questions? Yes, you, sir. 
Oh, there we go. Uh, drones that flies. Yeah, the main reason is that it's kind of illegal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> NAV Canada is really strict that uh, first, uh, the drones has a very weight limit, over 250 grams, it's getting crazy, uh, you need to be at pilot or ish. And it's, uh, no, it's very, very constrained. Uh, stuff flying for now, lots of constraints. Oh, it's a... It's a <laughs> but what? Once the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the Canadian Aviation Systems is uh, figuring out how drones will work in the ecosystems, this will be definitely uh, plausible. And I won't hide you that 5G and drones flying is kind of uh, something that we look and investigate closely because that's definitely the future for, for uh, well, look, operating these things. Inception, that's awesome. Whoa. Woo. All right. We're actually not that short on time, but I, I would like to touch on some technical, de technical details before we play more with this. You can see we can easily get distracted once it works. So uh, Yeah, the whole office gets distracted when these things fly yeah, around. Yeah. <laughs> Which has not been a time sink at all, I promise. Please, if anybody's watching back home. It's uh, trying to commit suicide, so yes, I'm just going to try to... stop it a little bit while I <laughs> keep going with the slides. So I'm interested to see if I, we're going to lose control in a second because I'm going to switch back to Keynote. The, the no, that's sad. Sadly, the Chrome tab has to be in focus to the joystick to actually Oh, and people, you, see, you can see uh, actual ATN's face on, on the drone, so no, yeah, look yeah. at here. Oh, yeah, so yeah. the idea was to get uh, like the driver's seats, because uh, this will seat, sit in the car, and it was kind of uh, fun to have the driver face in the car, kind of like, you know, concept. Uh, but it costs bandwidth, so I'm not sure we're going to keep that stream. Uh. I'm super fascinated why it's limping along. I've never seen it do that, ever. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's try to get the, this, back, this show back in shape. Oh, yeah, another fun fact. Our remote is hooked up to the wrong Wi-Fi. <laughs> so let's see. Is that going to work? Oh, we're good. All right. Let me go back to the slides. Shit. Are we in good shape? <laughs> I'll let Francois deal with the thing. Don't break it. We have to bring it. I'll try. Uh, all right. So, cool. As we just saw, uh, well, before the demo, we talked about how we have pretty tight deadlines, right? Yes. And we've talked about the technical challenges and the fact that, at least at first, when we were prototyping, before we went to the nice folks at uh, Walrus who are doing a lot of the actual model work and all that, we had to prototype to make sure we had something on our hands. So, uh, we looked pretty early to see how could we get the best return on investment in our dev time, uh, being that the Android team was, hi, me. Uh, and the rest of the team is like, you know, awesome in ML and all I, that. But I made one pull request. Oh, that's, that is true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Which didn't compile. I wasn't going to mention that. But <laughs> so uh, multi-platform was our pick of choice. Uh, if you know me a little bit, I'm a bit of a Kotlin fanatic at this point. And as a lot of Kotlin folks, we're looking always to an excuse to actually, uh, you know, use multi-platform. If actually probably talking to the wrong crowd because everybody that's interested in multi-platform is probably in the other talk, which is about multi-platform. But hey, uh, it's still kind of pretty cool. In um, the months, they could watch the video, so. Yeah, that is true. All right, so what we, did we use? We found this pretty nice library that allows you to use WebRTC on both uh, iOS, Android, and the web. So as you could see from uh, our, our talk so far, the web and Android were the particular two uh, targets that were interesting us. Uh, so under the hood, that library, uh, Heresy, actually uses a React Native build of a, the official web uh, RTC org uh, libraries. You might be wondering why there's this sort of mid-step. If you've ever tried to compile the web RTC uh, libs, I'm told it's, that you would understand. <laughs> All right. It's worth pointing out at this stage that WebRTC on its own is like a fairly huge subject, right? And nobody likes a long uh, tech lecture, especially when you only have 20 minutes left on the clock. So we're going to be touching on the basics today. I'm not even going to go deep dive on what we did to make it efficient. I'm just going to sort of give you the overall plan. A few slides of code, but uh, you'll see we won't dwell too much on it. Uh, that being said, it's totally worth digging into WebRTC and seeing the capabilities behind it. You can do some pretty crazy stuff. It doesn't just do meetup, as, uh, as you can see. We drive a car, but you can also manipulate images, do filters, all sorts of fun stuff. So if you're interested in that, look up the official page. They have, regard, regardless of how difficult the library is to compile, they have really great tutorials and pretty cool ideas and you know, a lot of 
in-depth content there to find that will uh, be of interest to you. So back to our project. Our structure is as simple as it gets. Uh, we have a, an Android app which controls the car. We'll touch on that in a few minutes. And we have a JS app project, we've, which you've basically seen an early prototype of on screen. We have a web page that allows us to connect to the cars. And uh, we have a lib shared where most of the code for handling the WebRTC connection and the sessions and the lifecycle and all of that lives. So uh, touching on what WebRTC on a high level is, you effectively really need to understand only these three concepts. You have a media stream, so that's what grabs the actual video, gets the frames, gets the audio. So it's a common interface across different platforms that allows you to just say, I need a video stream, I need an audio stream, and specify what kind of resolution or frequency or, or you know, all those kind of things that you want. You have an RTC peer connection that's like a common object across platforms again. And that one is effectively how you configure the session, how you sort of say, how do I want to reach out to the peer? Uh, what kind of things do I want in there? Uh, what kind of actual size of data do I want in my pipe? And how you actually shut down the connection as well and take care of all the housekeeping stuff. And lastly, you have RTC data channel. You can pipe anything in those, uh, but in our case, uh, we pipe the joystick signals and some telemetry back from the cars. Like, for example, we've, uh, Walrus has been experimenting with like, magnets on the track to help with the inference or to detect if they cross the line. So you can do all sorts of interesting things if you think about ultrasonic sensors and all that. There's like, a lot you can do with this stuff. All right, so I'm going to fly over the code a fair bit, but uh, the idea behind it is that we use a fairly, nowadays, typical Android uh, sort of reactive approach. So we have an RTC model. That RTC model is holding all of its state in this class that you see right here called RTC data. Now, I'm showing it. It's a bit redundant. You can see that there's a local stream. You can see there's a remote stream, a current peer connection, data channels. Those are the three big pieces I've just talked about. I'm mostly showing it because of one imp important piece is the current RTC session job. The same reason I can't go into the deep dive of how a session is managed because there's a lot of things going on at once and you have to orchestra orchestrate together in a very tight way, otherwise your app is simply going to crash. Those uh, low-level native WebRTC libraries are not very tolerant of people sort of skirting around the edges. So the idea is that a job and the coroutine management allows us to keep very tight reins on how that cycle works and we can shut down things at the right time in the right order without uh, you know, overall extra complexity. Uh, without coroutines, that would be very difficult. Uh, so, in this case, I'm touching rapidly on one of the big three pieces, the media stream. The car, in this case, right, is streaming video to us. So this shows you a little bit how you set up a pipe to, how you set up that stream. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that, in some cases with WebRTC, uh, the communication channel, WebRTC itself, is going to decide to adjust the parameters of your request and your configuration on the fly when it's talking between peers. So if you want to avoid that, you can start configuring things uh, by saying, I actually want ideally this specific frequency, this specific uh, width and height. And if you do that, then you know, WebRTC is going to try to stick to those rules. Uh, the other small thing I wanted to show is that in our case, for example, we want to pick the right lens for the car. There's a few lenses on this car. So you want to pick a wide angle to get like better gameplay and all of that. There's obviously a lot more options when you start playing with these streams and if you start playing with audio, but you get the idea. Uh, and that last little piece might be a bit of a, of a, you know, why is he showing that implementation detail? But I just wanted to show the idea that we're still working in the reactive type stream, that whenever we do something, we post those state changes into like a medium that's like uh, immutable and all those nice concepts. So even though we're playing around with a library that is very stateful, we try to expose it in a bit less of a stateful way to the outside world or internally so that you know, we don't shoot ourselves in the foot continuously, which is really easy to do with uh, these types of libraries. So at this point, I decided code is probably not what we want to see because you know, we'll be here all day. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about how a WebRTC connection is negotiated. There's a solid chance if you've played with this, this is old stuff, but if you've never played with it, then it might be a little bit of interest. So typically when you have a WebRTC connection, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and there's effectively somebody that's going to be identified logically as a caller, and you have a callee. 
So if in this case the client is the one calling out on the car, which is probably just waiting to get called upon, then you actually send a thing called an offer, which is type, a very specific type of thing in WebRTC called a session description, wherein you have all sorts of details of the configuration. The car will answer or your peer will answer, and then you've shared this information, and now both ends know how they want to set up the connection, but they don't know how yet. And so that part has to be solved through something called ICE candidate negotiation. So that's a pretty fancy uh, little thing. So what does that literally mean? ICE candidates, you can see as if you were both uh, devices were doing a trace route to find out where they are in a network. And then they share this information so that afterwards they can actually try to match up on their own. So you, you're going to sense a theme in what I'm talking about here. So how do these things happen if those two peers don't know each other yet, right? How do they actually send all that information back and forth? And so the idea is to keep in mind the following uh, thing is that, I'll skip over this, you need to have what's called a signaling solution. And the signaling solution is something that you build yourself. So in our case, what we decided to do to keep things very simple, and since we were on the web and wanted to have like as little server code as possible, we went with effectively a semi-serverless solution. Uh, oh, that's nice. Actually, I'm going to take a sip of that in a minute. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> you see, he read my mind. That's, yeah. like, that's like a good teammate right there. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, it's going to start. Re refreshing. <laughs> We're going to be taking requests after this. Uh, all right. so. Um, yeah, talking about Firebase, so the idea is that we wanted a semi-serverless solution. So Firebase, in our case, is only a data storage solution. We wanted to be able to store these offers, these answers, these ICE candidates, and let both ends of the communication know about it. So if you're familiar with Firebase, what both peers can do is subscribe to Firebase and get notified whenever stuff comes in and start you know, their life cycle, the appropriate life cycle, as needed. So, the interesting bit with this is that you're in sort of a semi-serverless type of approach, and it's really a misuse of the term, honestly, but the concept is that since you have common code in your Kotlin modules, right, that is shared between both peers, both clients, effectively, then they can decide how to interpret the data that's stored on Firebase and how that data is updated, and then sort of figure out the signaling themselves. So as long as you make sure to have peers that are based on the same version of the software, uh, you can save a lot of time there. So in our case, since it's a relatively small scale project, we weren't too worried about versioning changes and things like that. So this approach worked out really well for us. And uh, yeah, and I'm obviously not going to go over all that code. If you're ever curious, by the way, I'm happy to share all sorts of insights about this, uh, this stuff after you just find me in the conference floor. Uh, yeah, the last thing I wanted to touch on code-wise, and we're getting into the red zone of time, but we have just enough time to finish this. Uh, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Can you tell? Uh, yeah, last thing is that if you have a uh, common code environment and a multi-platform project, you probably are aware that you know things don't always work out. So specifically, Firebase does not have right now an official multi-platform uh, library that can help you sort of keep things really, really tidy. So this interface is like your typical idea. We have an interface in the common block that defines how we can talk to Firebase in a very abstract way. And afterwards, we just need to go and implement fairly simple classes that respect this interface, provide that to our common code section, our signaling server. And you know we're off to the races, as the title says. All right, so uh, a few last fun bits. So we're going to talk about electronics. Uh, so what is this picture? Like, you might see that I've been you know, using a few visuals. If you look at the, the, the titles and beneath, I'm very inspired by the fact that I like Mobius, the cartoon artist, and we're in that room specifically right now. So concept. concept. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty buzzed about it, yeah. All right, so ESP32s, what are they? Uh, well, they're cheap. <laughs> that's, that's very interestingly the big thing. Uh, this one is like the deluxe extra, you know, everything on top kind of version. It's a uh, ESP32 that supports the LoRa, uh, LoRa standard of communication. It also supports, as most ESP32s do, Wi-Fi, BLE. This one is fancy because it has a little blue screen that you can actually report stuff on, which is pretty neat. If you're playing around and, and developing, that's like a big, uh, big thing. If you want that uh, to develop, that's actually very interesting to see what's going on. 
Uh, what else? Well, it has, you know, simple micro USB connector. Typically, they all have uh, these chips, you, these microcontrollers. You connect them to your PC. You can program them very simply through that port. Uh, but you can also draw power from it. So they're powered by via that, that uh, micro USB. Uh, but this one is fancy. It has LiPo power management. So if you have a small LiPo battery, uh, this device smartly will charge that LiPo battery when it's connected to the micro USB. And that micro battery has like, uh, that, sorry, that LiPo battery has like a pretty long shelf life. And you know, for 20 euros or just about even cheaper, I think, uh, this is a pretty fun uh, dev platform. In our case, though, we went with a simpler one. These, the one on the left right here is like only got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and the, the regular pinout and the little connector. These, these suckers are like eight euros, pretty much. Um, and what's nice about the SP32s uh, is that since they're programmable, they're very flexible, but you can hook them up to all sorts of electronics. So what you see on the right is a Raspberry Pi motor hat. So this is the power, the, what powers the motors on the rover that we just showed you. And the SP32, even though this is actually a shield for a Raspberry Pi, with a very simple pinout and a, little, a few lines of programming in the right driver, uh, we could reuse these parts very easily, even though they were not designed at all for this kind of setup. Uh, so this is our original prototyping setup. And you know, I've said it's very simple. This looks worse than it really is, honestly. Like At the end of the day, all you need to hook up these, these, uh, the, the Pi hat in our specific example is four wires, like two, uh, one for ground, one for voltage, and two uh, signal pins, and that's it. But the thing is that sometimes you sort of need to do a little bit more work to like, you know, protect your devices against the rigors of real-world uh, use. So uh, you know, we did get around to printing a nice little 3D shell and a holder for the phone and, and making sure that the wires were all tidy and everything. So that's like, a, you know, if you're a hobbyist, uh, or in our case, I guess we should say we're professionals. <coughs> MacGyvers. <laughs> yeah, MacGyver is a, team that, a term that goes around in the team a lot. We, we kind of like MacGyver. So, you know, it, it keeps things nice and tidy and allows us to experiment pretty quickly. All right, so uh, yeah, we're still OK to, to yeah, blab on. Yeah, we're so good. I'm going to take a sip of water. Feels good? <sighs> yes, good. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> all right, so how do you program an ESP32? So if you're interested in all of this, easiest way to go about things, you buy that eight euro board, and then you get yourself the Arduino IDE. Uh, what's neat about this IDE is not so much the code support, but the fact that all the libraries that you would need for most of the boards you find on Amazon are very easily findable in the, there's a library index. You go show, I want to support, I want the support from my board, and it's, I have this, this, and that. Or even say, I need the driver for that motor hat that I talked about earlier. All of this can be found in the interface. And even though it's an Arduino development kit, it works very well with ESP32. Or you ask ChatGPT, but. <laughs> yes, well, you know. Maybe that's why the, the, the drone was like limping along, right? It tried to be sent in somebody, drones. Somebody asked ChatGPT while I wasn't looking. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the other platform uh, would effectively be uh, VS Code with Platform I.O. So that's if you want a more professional grade type environment with proper build tools. It also has very nice support to find libraries and all that. Um, we're sort of slowly going towards that. Honestly, we don't have that much code to, for our rovers. Uh, the team we're working on that's doing the uh, models and all that, they've been on this platform. They showed it off to me a few bits, and it's, it's quite nice. Like, I would recommend if you're familiar with VS Code or you have, like, you know, you like all the IntelliJ tooling rename and all that nice uh, syntax uh, highlighting and, 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 and finding a mistake compile, all that, that, all the features are in there, so it's a pretty good setup. Uh, right, so one thing we didn't touch on is how do we actually talk to the Android phone and connect the microcontrollers to it? And uh, we've kept it for the end of the talk because it's actually super simple. You just need to use this library. Uh, the, the way we went about things is that we decided to talk to the device uh, using serial port over USB. So what that effectively means is that you simply connect a micro USB to USB-C connector in your phone. And boom, the microcontroller appears, uh, as far as the phone's concerned, as a USB uh, device and uh, as a serial COM port. So using this specific library, which is a pretty classic one, I think. Most people use this one when they want to talk to devices over USB. Uh, you'll detect the device. You'll be able to start sending bytes. And uh, for in our case, like, all that we do is send like something like between four and eight bytes of data per message to control things. 
And I was talking about how ESPTD2s are super versatile. What's fun is that in this specific case, for these uh, more high-powered race cars that are the effective platform of what we're going to run on track, uh, these have fewer controls, pretty much. They don't need a motor board. They have the engines themselves have pinouts that you can control. So in our case, we were able to just take the same ESP32s, change the code around a little bit, and uh, you know get support for a totally different type of platform. So that's like pretty versatile. Uh, then, uh, well, yeah, I think I'm going to let it off to Francois yeah, to talk so a little bit about... Yeah. So that's an overview of our Future. tentative this year to make the first glimpse at tele-robotics. Obviously, this is like a long journey for us. We hope to make it mature enough so that we can build something for industries or uh, public. So this could be a game that people play. Uh, I, I think there's, I saw a project that actually have this in mind, but... It's just us to optimize the network to support these type of use case for now. But we see that uh, in the near future, I, I really want my sandbox with a digger <laughs> and actually uh, manipulate that through a distance. And this is really an application that could be used in Canada. We have Far North Mines that has a very long distance from the urban areas, and it's got a fortune to send people there to drive those diggers. So what if we drive them uh, through tele-robotics? So that's kind of the spirit of uh, this type of technology. Uh, right now, there's a lot of challenge in terms of latency. The latency is not coming from the network, per se, but more for the ingesting the frames into the CCDs and the buffers of the jitters. So we need to figure out a way to optimize this. We don't use right now specific hardware or optimize uh, hardware for capture. Uh, that's definitely going to be uh, required for more advanced use cases. Uh, but for now, we're uh, super happy if you want to discuss about this uh, after this talk. Uh, we're open for business. And Actually, if you have any questions, I think we have only three minutes left, but I think it would be interesting to ask questions to the public. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Thank you. We thank were you. so clear. Yes. So, any questions from the audience? I know that's, you know, people you are. You guys could shocked. try this. Technically speaking, in three, four weeks. <laughs> yes. yes <laughs> so uh, I don't, I'm not sure, though, it's going to be drivable. We're going to do a filter out of the latency. So if your client is uh, over uh, 200 milliseconds, uh, t tough luck, you won't be able to drive our stuff because you're going to crash in the, car, uh, in, the, in the walls anyway. Well, so, I hear they have much better network here than back Oh, they home. have a super good network, but uh, across yeah. the Atlantic. Oh, question here. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have, uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, do you really need to use an Android phone uh, for the car? Actually, the target initially was Raspberry Pi. Um, we went for the phones for a couple of reasons. First, stabilization of the camera, the battery, the 5G modems. Uh, there were a couple of reasons we find it simpler. We didn't saw the, the latency issues. Uh, until we had late. also a few ideas around processing image on board and things like that, right? With Jafar, maybe. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Uh, the, I mean, and one of the main reasons we pick Android is really to put the AI inside the, the phone to control the car. So that will not be possible with Raspberry Pi. Could be with Jensen and NVIDIA solutions, but right now it's uh, we only have like three months, so <laughs> we're. Uh, Let's start slow. <laughs> yeah, it allowed us to skip a few steps, really, is why we ended up going with the phones, right? Like, we... Yeah. Did, but, yeah, it's a totally good question. If, like, it would... Uh, it's part of our exploration. So, sure. $85 robots, $1,000 phones. Makes sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, we, you can find us uh, on the floor for sure. Uh, now we're done. We're going to actually probably, you know, see a few no, things. No, we still have one minute 30. One minute 30 left. Well, I see some people leaving, so we're going to say thank you no, and yeah. uh, find us. Please